Hello everyone. Good morning, good afternoon and good evening uh, from wherever you are watching. Welcome back again. Uh, this is the breakout defender track. I'm Swapnil Shinde. I'll be moderating uh, this session for today. Uh, just keep in mind, if you have any questions, just submit them in the Q&A tab just on the right hand side of this video. We will have around five to 10 minutes in the end for the questions you have. Okay, so we have Mr. Iqbal Singh with us. He is an expert uh, security architect specializing in application, product, and cloud security with almost 12 years of cybersecurity experience, including six years in development. Mr. Iqbal is also an AWS certified cloud practitioner and has played a pivotal role in helping organization uh, esta uh, establishing robust AppSec and cloud SEC programs. He will be giving a talk titled Lessons Learned, a retrospective on application security and failures. This captive presentation promises to offer pr uh, practical insights and recommendations for enhancing application security in your organizations. So over to you, Mr. Iqbal. Thank, thank you, Swapnil. I'll, I'll share the slides. Uh, and I'll start from, all right. So uh, thanks everyone uh, for, for joining today. Uh, and uh, feel free to send any any questions to uh, Swapnail. I'll take it then. So, uh, so the topic for today's talk is a uh, retrospective on application security failure. Uh, first, first of all, I should have introduced myself. So I'm Iqbal Singh. I'm application security architect. Uh, I'm based in Melbourne, Australia, uh, and helping one of the biggest super super innovation funds uh, in in Australia to set up uh, uh, their AppSec program. So today I will be discussing uh, my my personal journey. Uh, I have helped uh, set up application program for four to five different companies in last ten years. So I will share some some of the key points that you could take away from today's presentation uh, that will help you uh, set for success. And you can also uh, get to know what could actually derail your application security program. So. Yeah, this is brief introduction uh, from me. Uh, so you see, I started as as a Java developer, uh, and 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 then I moved to application security full time. So 2020, 2010 was those days when you uh, I was using open source tooling, uh, just only the uh, SCA software composition analysis. Uh, or you might have heard uh, about OWASP dependency check. Those were the really early days. So. Uh, my journey has been um, like uh, completely transformed. Now I'm I'm more more of a, a security architect working with uh, Unisuper uh, Annuation and Pension Fund. So the the there there is uh, the issue with the super annuation and the pension industry is our our target user are are senior citizens or 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 the guys over 65 67 when they are eligible for pension. Which, which brings in a, a, a interesting challenge how you secure uh, their money because because they are not that tech savvy and and they they are easy target uh, for for the phishing scam so I'm, I'm just helping them to uh, build their AppSec program so going to the agenda today I will talk about uh, the good and bad things about uh, AppSec program, uh, bad in terms of like these uh, actions, if, if you take these actions that could actually derail your AppSec program and good if you are aware of like key uh, requirements plus uh, the best uh, practices to set up uh, application security within your organization that could uh, help you build a robust uh, application security program. And I will also be touching on uh, how you can secure cloud native applications. Uh, it is different from securing uh, traditional uh, like monolith applications that you run on your data centers because here you are securing microservices and, and that's a different ball game. And I will also uh, present a, a unique uh, use case. Uh, people may have done this already, but I will, I will show a use case where I move I used uh, shift right analogy to 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 build uh, app tech program so by shift right I mean uh, once you are, have deployed uh, uh, your your stuff or your uh, deployed uh, 
all, all your code into production and you have so many issues how how you are going to deal with that situation. So uh, I introduced tooling after uh, the deployments and, and then used uh, certain certain techniques uh, techniques that I will share today so that you can build uh, scanning capa capability uh, within, within the CACD pipelines. So let's uh, jump into, so I will start with the basics of application, setting up application security programs. So, uh, first uh, and 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 the important thing is to choose uh, AppSec tooling, and I have highlighted these items in here. Uh, at the least, you should be uh, selecting uh, software composition analysis tool, or or some people call it open source uh, scanning tool, and then static analysis tool, uh, which will scan your code for uh, issues uh, such as. Um, cross-site scripting, injection flaws, and also you would require a developer learning platform where you can uh, invite your developer to uplift their skills. So the whole idea of using tooling and these learning learning platform is to uh, uplift the skills of the developer so that they, uh, they, they can uh, do a security bit themselves within, within like a year or two of your apps like program. Uh, other parts of AppSec tooling that uh, that I mentioned here is IA, IAC scanning uh, or infrastructure as code scanning uh, with the cloud native application. You need IAC scanners to find out security issues before uh, pushing into the production environments. And also uh, everyone is running Dockers. Uh, sorry, uh, everyone is doc uh, dockerizing their applications and running containers. So Docker security uh, scanning is, is another important component and uh, secret scanning, uh, hard coded secret scanning within, within your, uh, within your Git, uh, GitHub or Bitbucket or code repos is, is another important uh, tooling that you should have. Uh, some, some of the SAS uh, tools can also scan uh, for uh, secrets, but but if if you think about it, if you have to find just only the active secrets, then then you should be using uh, specialized uh, secret scanning tooling. Uh, I have omitted the DAST part or API uh, security scanning in in this slide, but you can also use those as as a part of your AppSec program. So now the things will get interested. Uh, interesting. So for example, like th this is like my observations pre. 2020 or 2019, pre-COVID, I would say. So companies were like uh, used to have these uh, CS SaaS and they, they were uh, coming from different, different vendors. So uh, so some were good at a CA, some was good at uh, SaaS. And then there, there were a few companies that were using uh, paid uh, tooling from one or two for, for SE or SaaS. And then they tried to use some open source tooling uh, uh, to, to complete their apps like program. But the problem here is, for example, if you are using multiple vendors, it brings in interesting problem. You have to do a lot of stuff. Like you have to do vendor security assessments for all these vendor to, to just uh, to know their, uh, are they good enough? Uh, uh, do they have best practices? Is, is there, uh, is there, tooling good enough to use it within my organization. And sometimes you have a GRC dedicated person in the GRC team who could do that. Sometimes it falls back on, on the small AppSec engineer to do that vetting. And then you, you have to uh, do uh, multiple access requests. For example, you provision SCA from one vendor and then after one month you onboarded SaaS, then you have to do the as, uh, access uh, request, uh, you have to provide access to the developers and then uh, you have to run multiple billing cycle for these one. And another big problem I see in here is you, you need uh, another uh, tool uh, uh, for, for the reporting. So you have to uh, uh, need a reporting orchestration tool where you, which, where, where you could feed reports from all these vendors and, and then present it to the senior management. So that was pre uh, 20, 20, 2020 or 2019, but I still see some companies have that mentality. 
uh, and the integration is also a pain. You have to integrate these tooling multiple times. So uh, what I have seen, like uh, the trend now has moved more towards using uh, uh, ASPM, uh, Application Security Posture Management, which is a second generation to uh, AppSec tooling. So this is a platform, a centralized, centralized platform, which provides uh, SCA, SAS uh, scanning uh, capabilities, some ASPM tooling have uh, developer learning platforms as well, and, and IEC scanning capabilities. Uh, so uh, this is this is the future. So it the benefits of uh, this ASPM tooling is you do not have to do multiple integrations. It is easy rollout. You do not have to do go through the multi multiple vendor security assessments, and you do not need to run uh, multiple billing cycles, and you do not need another tool just to, just to just for the reporting purpose. So this presents. Uh, a good uh, option for, for for the companies who want to set up uh, their their appsec uh, program and once you integrate it it with with your uh, version control system it's done you do not have to redo again so uh, this is where i think uh, uh, the appsec industry is moving so if you want to set up your program i would say prefer using aspm rather than using multiple tools uh, from uh, from different vendors, it will save you time and money, and uh, this this has a lot of benefits which I will discuss uh, in the next slide. So the learnings uh, from from you choosing the tooling is if you have if multiple vendors if you uh, toolings from multiple vendors or you you plan to use multiple vendors for a uh, CSS, uh, that may not be a right choice because. Um, it was designed for uh, for for the application security teams, and it is a siloed approach. It it is not uh, um, that easy to roll out. You will have difficult uh, uh, difficulty in uh, providing access because it will it it will put more uh, overheads on on the IT support teams. People will be raising multiple requests for SCSS, uh, and you have to do. Uh, integration multiple times and multiple uh, billing and, and 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 vendor security assessments will be uh, required uh, also uh, you will uh, have this decentralized reporting it, there it won't be at one place but if you are using aspm or application security posture management it it, it is a, a centralized platform where you have all all your tooling uh integrated ones and and Sometimes it, it is more affordable than using multiple vendors because uh, I have done a lot of POC for ASPMs, like different different vendors, and most of the time they they charge you for SC or S, uh, SaaS only, and other offerings are are, are free uh, to use for certain period of times, like three or four years, uh, and also uh, you do not have to worry about multiple billing cycle. Uh, a, with with the ASPM, you can also choose uh, if you want to just have only a CA uh, to to begin with. So there is nothing like that. You you if you buy ASPM, you have to buy a CA plus a SAS plus Docker scanning plus IEC scanning. So you could start small uh, with ASPM as well. Uh, so these are the learnings uh, from choosing the right tooling. So, but I will also want to highlight what are the cons. Uh, with ASPM, so I I feel like it uh, uh, the smaller security vendors will find it difficult to compete because uh, because uh, the bigger organization will buy up smaller smaller companies to introduce more uh, type of scanning like FIM, for example uh, the ASPM start started with uh, SE and SAS and then they built on. Uh, adding IEC scanning, Docker security scanning. So smaller security vendors maybe find a very difficult to compete. Also, a uh, security team may be forced to uh, like force into a one size uh, fits all approach. Maybe uh, some ASPM are good at SCA, uh, some some are good at SAST, and they might not be good at other other uh, type of scanning especially uh, uh, IEC scanning. So yeah, they might, might be forced to use a tooling uh, which may or may not be fit for purpose. Uh, but I, I can see uh, the uh, ASPM will keep on improving 
uh, day by day and and it it is actually the future if you if you are looking into setting up your appsec uh, program so uh, another important topic i came across is uh, setting up uh, appsec program there are different stages so i what i have seen is like people throwing money at the appsec tooling buying appsec, AppSec tooling is the easiest thing you could do uh, but uh, rolling it out in different stages is, is the difficult part. So you could buy uh, AppSec tooling. And then if you are uh, running at rocket speed, it will actually derail your AppSec program. So if you are enforcing tooling in the block mode early, that will break uh, the builds. So so it's, it's not the best practice. So what you should be doing is to uh, first... Uh, move your app tech program slowly in, in different uh, stages. Uh, crawl, I, I, I had this written in four stages. Uh, crawl, where you choose your app tech tool, you integrate, and here your focus should be just uh, aiming for the visibility. How much uh, security data I have? Where do I stand? Uh, what are my, my requirements uh, to choose the tooling? And how easy it is to integrate uh, other things, like does it integrate with SSO uh, and, and all that stuff? Once you have integrated, then you have to work on uh, creating a minimum with baseline. Uh, it could be something similar, uh, something like no new, no new security issues uh, uh, in, in the new code. Uh, so then uh, you have to uh, socialize the reports. Uh, what is my existing security debt with the development teams or the stakeholders so, so that you can plan for the fixes in, in the jog uh, stage. So here I have seen like most of the organization uh, like who are not running the greenfield projects may end up uh, in the jog stage because they, they need a lot of time in, in uh, fixing the existing security there. But uh, here I would say like work as an application security engineer, work with, with your development teams on on finding the uh, high high stake issues or 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 I will call call uh, showstoppers. So fix those those ones for, uh, first, and then if you are just starting a new project, you can just go uh, full block mode uh, from the day day one. And this is just about maximizing the capabilities you have. Uh, so this is all about appsec tooling. But when you are setting your appsec program, appsec tooling. Is, is the first bit and most of the organization will stuck in here but you need a lot of other uh, initiatives to to uh, bring a robust uh, ap application security program uh, so other things that you could uh, have is developer training sessions uh, you can start early start in the crawl stage and also start uh, thread modeling workshops, uplift the skills of the developers so they, they can do thread modeling themselves. And in the jog stage, these, these two are the dream, uh, uh, I would say initiatives, giving security requirements before a task is, is started. It's, it's, it means like you, you are tackling the security requirements early, which will means you won't find security issues later on when you uh, deploy to the production. So, uh, and design patterns is is, is uh, these patterns will dictate uh, how developers are going to write their code. Uh, for example, you could develop uh, external uh, uh, API scanning design. Uh, sorry, API pattern. Uh, so when you you uh, connect with external APIs, you should be connecting over TLS 1.2 HTTPS minimum. Um, then you should be using authentication, authorization, JWTs, and those stuff. But if, if you are just thinking uh, AppSec tool, tooling is enough, it may not get you that far. Uh, to complement AppSec tooling, you need to uh, think what's beyond AppSec tooling. Uh, things like developer training session and these uh, threat modeling will help you uh, set uh, your uh, AppSec program. Uh, so what, what are the learnings that I have observed uh, over, over the years is moving the AppSec program at right uh, right pace is very important. So I was working with one of the organization, they, they bought a CA, SAS, uh, uh, and security scanning and, and Docker scanning. And at one moment we had these, these tools throwing so much stuff at us, at AppSec engineers that 
uh, that we were not able to triage which which one are true positive, which one are false positive. And then at the same time, we did not have enough, had uh, enough development capacity. Like there was not enough developer who could fix uh, what's coming out of these, uh, these apps tooling. So I would suggest start small. Maybe you could start with a CA and SAS or maybe one, one of these two only. Uh, once you're comfortable, you, you set up a minimum baseline and then then you look at other things and you 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 have to then uh, work on what what's a next high stake item so uh, it's actually opposite of what I said in earlier use ASPM uh, which has all the tooling but you can start uh, using ASPM with SCA uh, subscription or SAST uh, subscription only and and in order to uh, complement appsec tooling uh, think about uh, using uh, what's what's beyond appsec tooling uh, threat modeling and those stuff which i will cover uh, in 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 the next uh, next slides so uh, i have seen like once your uh, appsec tools find uh, issues uh, what what the perception is appsec engineer goes and raises these jira tickets and people start working on those Jira tickets, uh, but but that mentality won't uh, get you far because you you are eliminate, eliminating Jiras, not um, bug classes. So I give you an example. I was working at an organization. They they introduced a new secret scanning tool, and uh, that found so many secrets, hard coded secrets in within the uh, GitHub. And they they created like uh, more than hundred tickets. I said, what's 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 going on? And uh, actually what they should have done is to uh, use design patterns. One of the pattern could be how you store secrets uh, within the within within your uh, production environment. Are you going to use uh, uh, something like Secrets Manager or HashiCorp Vault where you are going to store the secret and how you are going to reference it uh, uh, when once your application will run. Uh, so, Thinking like this and and implementing and using design pattern will get uh, rid of bug classes versus uh, getting rid of Jira's. So you know you know the difference in here. You are eliminating bug classes rather than just fixing or uh, smaller uh, one ticket at a time. Uh, I I have like these these are other design patterns you could utilize. So for example, if you are uh, if you have encryption, if you are using, uh, say, a database, if you could define what uh, uh, encryption could uh, be, you, you should be using at rest, like AES-256 is an example, versus if you have you are working in heavily regulated uh, industry, industry such as financial industry, you can define, like, for encryption, I could, uh, be, I should be using customer managed key rather than the default keys provided by the by the say uh, cloud service provider so those design pattern will help you uh, uplift your appsec program uh, so some some other things that you could uh, think of is defining application event logging standards or or uh, or patterns what events should be logged at application level and, and in what format so that it is easy for the SOC teams uh, to, to search on any any uh, any uh, sus suspicious activity and, and then trigger the AppSec incidents re response uh, plan. Or other things that I have uh, noticed is lack of, uh, say, input validation routine. So for example, you could uh, start design patterns on, on uh, uh, if you are taking user input, you should define uh, allow list. Uh, if you you are expecting only, uh, say, alphanumeric uh, input from the user, you you can define allow list, or you can define what are the sanitization libraries uh, that you you are allowed to use. And and on the back end for the databases, you could define um, stored procedures in advance. If you are uh, if you have to make a call to the database, use these stored procedures. So these are uh, some of the design patterns uh, that I I wrote myself and and uh, introduced while working for for different companies uh, and while I was setting their their appsec program. Uh, so uh, up up until uh, previous stage or up until the appsec tooling, what uh, what we were doing or I discussed was scan 
find stuff and then a fix. So which is more like a react a reactive app stack. So you are reacting to what these tooling uh, is, is finding for you. But if you have to move to uh, proactive app stack, you should be looking uh, beyond, uh, as I said, app stack tooling. So for example, you should have a sound and robust plan and strategy on patching and maintenance. So you shouldn't be uh, waiting for SEA tools or reports to say like this library has reached end of life, now go and upgrade it. So uh, what I introduced is uh, in one of the organization was I I, I made a made a I, I wrote a script that sends out notifications if a library um, is reaching end of life in next six months, or if a library is or older than three three years, then then they they were updating them uh, automatically, so they do not have to wait for SCA reports to trigger this patching and maintenance task. So this way you can think proactively and you you are not reacting to the uh, findings of these tooling. So other stuff that is really important is threat modeling and developer training sessions. So if if you 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 are just fixing the issues reported by tooling and not uplifting the skills of the developers, then um, it's it's not a proactive approach. Our ultimate ultimate goal as application security engineer is to hold the hands of the developers, train them to the tooling for first few months, few, maybe at the maximum one one year, and then they should be doing uh, the stuff uh, apps like scanning stuff or or maybe um, using those design patterns themselves so that we can focus on something else like high stake items. So. Yeah, threat modeling is, uh, I found out is the most underrated item, but it could really uh, bring in a lot of value if done, uh, if done early during during the, uh, during any, any feature implementation. Also, you should be looking into other departments like uh, ProdSec, uh, product, uh, product, product security plus uh, cloud security roadmaps for your organization. So you should be, um, from the AppSec program point of view, you should be in touch with those uh, uh, stakeholders. So some of, some of the companies, small small companies I have found, they, they do not have uh, product security uh, teams or cloud security teams, but still you can get in touch with product managers or, or DevOps manager to to see uh, what's, what, what they are thinking in terms of security and point out, um, for example, you are introducing uh, new identity, say for example, Okta. Uh, does it align with uh, product security roadmap, or or does it align with cloud security roadmap? If you are introducing new encryption scheme, can it be done uh, through the cloud service provider rather than implementing your own uh, encryption module? Can can I use something from AWS or or maybe uh, GCP? So. Uh, I think the best practice is to just keep uh, in, in touch with uh, cloud security teams plus pro, uh, product security team and, and think uh, holistically, take a, take a holistic uh, approach for your organization. Uh, sorry. So uh, what, what learning I, I would want you guys to take away from this is uh, you should not stick to just AppSec tooling. Throwing money is the easiest bit. Buying AppSec tooling is the easiest bit. Uh, but the difficult part is to uh, actually uh, uh, introduce other initiative which could actually help AppSec tooling or or which will uplift your AppSec program to that level that it, you, you can uh, say, uh, I am doing proactive AppSec. I'm not just reacting uh, on whatever this tooling is finding me. Uh, also aim for eliminating bug classes versus fixing Jira issues. Uh, patching and maintenance from, from my point of view, uh, uh, up until application level, like library framework should be responsibility of the developers. So uh, the real example, I was working for an organization, they, they, they worked under agile methodology uh, and, and uh, safe, uh, agile methodology where they plan for three months in advance, uh, six uh, sprints, but uh, half a sprint for each uh, in each uh, three month cycle, they they allocate for patching and maintenance and and uh, dealing with non functional security uh, non functional requirements including security. So 
in that way they they were just uh, patching whatever they they had to do so they do not have to like worry about when once um, uh, your framework or library reaches end of life uh, other stuff uh, work on the security requirements early that this could really help you uh, in in uh, writing secure applications uh, versus reacting uh, once you deploy to the production uh, issue ownership is also also a big concern so uh, it's it's a million dollar question who owns security appsec engineers development teams and and uh, whether it is a devops team issue if you, if you are developing cloud native applications uh, so as application security engineers we we if we are raising an issue we should be also uh, giving them suggestions on how to fix so most most of the time issue should be owned by by the application owner but if you are just throwing a report from a sas scanner like 100 page uh, sas uh, report from a sas scanner this will create friction among uh, security teams and, and the development teams. So once you are sure uh, out of these 100 issues, 100 page issues, there are one or two issues which are really true positive, also suggest them uh, how you're going to fix it. So for example, for, for SQL injection, what, what you could do is use a stored procedures. Uh, so those suggestions will really help in uh, development teams because the because developers are expert in writing features not uh, they may not necessarily be security expert so i take you back uh, in year 2010 or 2011 where we had separate front end developers separate back end de developers testers and then uh, deployment engineers devops engineers now expectations is really really high uh, the most of the jobs that are advertised uh, require full stack engineer who could work on the back end and the front end and also can deploy into the production environment. So yeah, so the, and now we are also talking about these should be developers should be security expert. Uh, but yeah, we we just have to hold their hand uh, for some time until they they become a security expert. Uh, so. Another important topic I want to talk about is how you could uh, secure uh, cloud cloud native applications. So what I have noticed is IEC scanner itself uh, is not enough in securing uh, cloud native applications because it won't uh, give you one hundred percent coverage. For example, uh, for the pro uh, for the services that are provisioned through console or I I call it click ops. Um, because IEC scan scanner can only scan, uh, say for example, Terraform or, or CloudFormation files. But if you are uh, provisioning uh, services through the console as well, that will won't be scanned by IEC scanner. Um, some of the use cases that I found, so Lambda run runtime environment, if it has reached end of life, it, it, it IEC scanners most of them struggle to find this this uh, kind of issue. Uh, also, they won't find neglected assets. So maybe at cer certain stage, through through console, you spin up say a uh, Dynamo DB unencrypted. Uh, I think Dynamo DB you cannot uh, provision unencrypted. Unencrypted maybe RDS, a relational database, uh, and and then you forget about it. You are not using it. It was only for POC, and you forget about it. IEC scanner won't find find it. Uh, another stuff like these scanners uh, i haven't found a scanner which could scan uh, iec code uh, which is written in aws cdk even if it uses cloud formation in the background or pulumi and there's another language that you could use to provision uh, provision uh, uh, cloud uh, services uh, you don't get runtime visibility like what's running inside your containers kubernetes or pods is is container talking to maybe a crypto miner, you cannot do find it through the IEC scanner, or if there is upload functionality within your uh, application and someone has uploaded a malware onto your uh, object storage, such as uh, S3 bucket, IEC scanner won't, won't tell you that thing. So what you could do is uh, you could use uh, something like uh, CSPM along with ESPM. So application security posture management, uh, plus cloud security posture management. Uh, so these uh, this guy will scan 
uh, for security issues in the running applications within your uh, cloud environments, for example, AWS. And, and uh, I will call it as a CNAP. So this combination, uh, along with CWPP, which is Cloud Workload Protection Platform, is, uh, is called uh, CNAP, Cloud Native Application Protection Platform. So uh, maybe some, some companies cannot afford it. You could still use open source CSPMs just to find uh, the security issues in your running infrastructure. So here is Borat saying it will be a great success if you could uh, have this set up, set up for uh, securing the cloud native applications. Uh, so, so this is what I talked about in agenda. Uh, I will be talking about shifting red, uh, right? So one of the company that I worked for, they had uh, a cloud native application running within AWS uh, and I was able to build a CI CD scanning capability uh, for the uh, uh, apps that were running uh, already. So the, these apps were not provisioned when I joined that companies and their, uh, their, their uh, workload were running on uh, EC2s or VMs, and it was monolith uh, architecture. Some, some, some of the applications were serverless, some were using microservices and uh, cloud services uh, were provisioned using IEC Terraform, and um, they just transitioned from ClickOps, but there was a lot of uh, uh, neglected asset uh, that was provisioned through console, uh, and they were still lying dormant uh, within within their AWS environment. Uh, one good thing about uh, about the company was they had consistent deployments. So everything goes from dev environment to staging environment and then to production environment. So if I could fix uh, the staging environment, uh, it would be easy for me to fix the production environment as well. So that was uh, what I was targeting. I I I was. Uh, targeting uh, to build CI/CD capability within non-prod environment first, and because if if I am introducing any blockades or guardrails in staging or non-prod environment, that won't affect their work because they will scream if if I am blocking their uh, deployments to the production. So that's what uh, uh, my my plan was, and there wasn't any IEC scanning uh, configured within the pipelines. Lot, lot of security misconfigurations. Uh, some of the security misconfigurations were very simple, like unencrypted storage for uh, S3 buckets, Dynamos, or uh, relational databases. Uh, VMs had uh, attached uh, IAM roles with full admin priv privileges. Uh, they operated in like three or four uh, AWS regions, but their infrastructure was deployed in uh, multiple AWS regions. There wasn't any data classification, so I used uh, certain uh, uh, services within AWS to introduce data classification as well. There was no backup and retention policies on any of the data, uh, and devs can jump. Uh, there was like um, cross account account roles where devs could jump from non prod environment to the production environment, and. Uh, because people were still spinning up services from the console, so there it was a configuration drift. So by drift, I mean whatever the state file you have uh, through coming through IEC code or or Terraform was not reflecting the actual uh, actual running services within within AWS environment because people were still spinning uh, new services with, from console. So. I found all this stuff using CSPM, Cloud Security Posture Management Tool. Now my, my task was to say, stop them provisioning an unencrypted uh, S3 bucket or an unencrypted databases. And uh, my task was to stop them uh, provisioning new EC2 with full IAM roles. My task was to stop them provisioning uh, regions which are not approved. So what, what, what I did was, use this um, shift right analogy where I know stuff is, um, my web application is already running. I use some of the some of the services from AWS. Uh, you see, this is non-production environment. I won't suggest it to try on the production environment. Uh, so with the control tower, ser uh, service control policies and tagging policies, I was able to 
restrict uh, resource provisioning if controls security controls are not met. So for example, if uh, con with the control tower, you could control what regions uh, you, you can uh, use. You can provision your uh, AWS services. So I allocated like these are the three wide listed um, uh, sorry, regions where you where developers or DevOps engineer can provision uh, services. If if uh, you are provisioning into uh, a region which is not allowed, uh, I I wrote a IEC rule uh, which will uh, I first collected data and then uh, uh, enforced IEC rules. So for example, if you are provisioning in in US East that is not in, in the wide listed region. Uh, break the build. I was writing these custom IEC rules. And with the SCP, uh, you can enforce things like if you are provisioning databases which are not uh, encrypted, I wrote an IEC rule to stop, uh, break that build again. And with that, with the tagging policies, uh, I introduce data classifications. So if, if you are introducing or writing, creating a new S3 bucket, if it doesn't have mandatory tag, uh, that will stop you from provisioning a new S3 bucket. So with, with the SCP, you can have a lot of controls uh, depending on your use cases, like you could stop people from using IAM roles with full admin access, but you can you can see my, my idea in here, collect all the data and then write roles. And the, these rules were enforced through the CI CD uh, pipelines. And, and then uh, if something from GitHub comes into, uh, someone tries to deploy stuff, doesn't, uh, doesn't uh, comply with these rules, the, uh, the CICD pipeline will break the build. Uh, but at the same time, one, one good feature of CSPM is to create uh, auto remediation templates. So for example, you are still provisioning, uh, you still have IAC code, which is provisioning on encrypted S3 buckets this CSPM tool could suggest you uh, this is the template that you could use to uh, provision uh, as uh, encrypted S3 buckets. So as I said, like I do not want uh, developers to uh, uh, to like spend much time on, on writing these uh, uh, or I do not want to give developer these report without uh, recommendation. So my recommendation was uh, this is the template that you could use to provision uh, encrypted S3 bucket. So they, they were still happy. Okay, I do not have to spend time. You might have to trigger more, more tests, that, that's it. So that's how I, I built it, uh, CICD scanning cap, uh, cap, uh, capability, uh, just uh, from moved from shift right to shift left. It, it took me like nearly nine months to, to 10 months and introducing uh, these uh, rules uh, one by one. So yeah, but I try to do this uh, on a purely AppSec, uh, AppSec uh, like non-cloud native applications that that was hard to replicate because uh, what I found is uh, securing uh, microservices is completely different from from securing monolith apps uh, because here you are dealing with a lot of stuff like you you are dealing with smaller smaller microservices or modules and then you have access. Uh, you have to think uh, how these are going to talk with each other rather than this one, one big guy. You might have to just worry about identity and this, uh, everything is encapsulated in here. Uh, but on the positive side of thing, I was able to uh, go from no AppSec to some AppSec uh, with, within, within uh, nine or 10 months. So these are some of the learnings that you could take away. Uh, yeah, I think I'm nearly towards the end of uh, my presentation. Uh, the key takeaways that I want to take you, uh, that I want you guys to take away from today's presentation is uh, ASPM is, is the future uh, of application security in terms of tooling. You guys, if you are going to start on your AppSec journey in 2023, think about using ASPM or second generation tooling. Uh, I would say I, I'm not going to name any vendors here because I'm not associated with any vendors. This is up to you what works with your requirements. Just go and choose a, a good ASPM tool and also think beyond AppSec tooling. This is the easiest bit. Uh, think about things like developer training session, threat modeling, design patterns that can complement your uh, AppSec program that will 
uh, really build a robust uh, application security program. Also, as I discussed earlier, think about eliminating bug classes, not JIRAs. Uh, also, proactive AppSec is the way, is a long-term strategy. You may not be able to go uh, proactive on, on the day one. You still have to start uh, with the reactive AppSec, but at certain stage, you should be looking into how you can be proactive rather than reactive. Uh, and also securing cloud-native applications. Uh, ASPM or AppSec scanning is not enough. Uh, you might have to take into consideration uh, CSPM or CNAP or CWPP. Uh, those cloud-native uh, scanning capabilities uh, will really complement your application security program. And uh, yeah, that is the way to go. Uh, yeah, I think that's it about today. Uh, I am actually finished with my presentation and happy to take uh, any questions. Thank you so much, Mr. Iqbal, for that amazing talk. So now moving to the question, uh, the first question we have from Mr. Tan, how do you track all the libs EOLs effectively? So uh, so for example, I, I was using a, a tool uh, which could actually, uh, so, which could actually, uh, I was able to utilize API to check when that was uh, uh, that library or framework was uh, uh, introduced into the market. And then I can could actually forecast uh, when uh, three years from uh, when it was released, I actually wrote a Python script that's on my GitHub profile. Uh, I'll share along uh, that one along. So you would actually look at the its release date versus uh, next three years down the line, that's how I, I I dealt with and I was saying like, okay, this has been released three years ago. Yeah, it's time to think about up, upgrade. Awesome. Uh, so the another question we have from Mr. Wang is EOL feeds are not very uniform. They don't use RSS or API. How do you standardize your EOL in six months? So uh, yeah, that 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 is really great questions. Uh, so I would say it, it it is tough because there is no consistent EOL uh, like publishing thing from from many of the frameworks. But I would work uh, f look at the high stake libraries. For example, uh, some of organization that I have worked with uh, were using Okta, which is essentially used for uh, authentication and authorization stuff. So. Another way you could get in touch with these vendors directly and, and ask what are their plans when when they are, this thing will die or when is the EUL. So most of the problem is with the open source uh, components that actually 90% of our software is. Uh, some of the libraries, these these like these use cases, uh, you still have to just go directly to the vendor or, or maybe uh, doesn't, doesn't uh, you cannot guess the EUL for those libraries six months down the line thing. Okay, uh, moving to another question uh, from Mr. George. What is your regular process for selecting the AppSec tech stack? So, um, so that's that's really good, good question. So first uh, thing is I work in a company which have really good uh, uh, GRC team, governance risk team. So first step is to do vendor security assessment. On, uh, on on the things that I'm going to use or my application is going to use. For example, uh, Okta is one, one of the example. So that will tell how, uh, what are the security practices or development practices within that organization or if there is any callouts. Uh, but uh, when com coming to the open source uh, or components, uh, you still have to again uh, fall back on these AppSec uh, app scanning tools, uh, SCA and SAST. And maybe if there is open source version on the GitHub, you just go and uh, scan with SAST and SCA. You should also be looking into bill of material files, which will give you an idea of what uh, dependencies or stale dependencies um, for the framework or, or the library that you are importing uh, within uh, your applications, uh, what versions they are, when was they released, is there any licensing infringement issues? Uh, but 
when when choosing a stack it 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 depends on your requirements or what you want to do or what uh, stack uh, is already being built upon or what the, your company is already using so if you are using .net uh, and you think like spring framework is more secure uh, you have you have spent 15 years writing .net code uh, moving to spring may not be a wise idea but if you are looking for security issues uh, sas sca bill of material files is, is the minimum plus vendor security assessment awesome and uh, another follow up question from mr george is what factors are you taking into account when conducting the comparative analysis of the different tools of the different aspm tools or yes yeah so so there there, there is a lot of stuff that you have to think about first you you have to think about what you your goals are what you do you want to achieve do you want to scan just only the frameworks or you want to scan um, uh, for security things like OS top 10 SQL injection? Do you also want to uplift uh, the skills of your developers? Do you need a learning platform? Uh, and then comes the other things uh, like reporting. Does it provide a centralized reporting? How easy the access is? Does it integrate with SSO? Uh, does it, is it pass my vendor security assessment? does uh, and and also look at the price so does uh, does uh, it fits within my budget plus does the good job uh, what others are offering uh, if you are using cloud native application does it provide iac scanners um, and uh, apart from that i will also be looking into things like secret scanners so uh, i found out some of the tools like sas tools scan secret but they they are not good at uh, for example um, if you have expired keys uh, within you, sitting within in your GitHub, uh, SAS will find it. But it, those are uh, uh, low value keys because those are expired. What you want to do is to find the active keys only. You do not want noise. So these are some some of the uh, minimum factors that you should be looking when comparing different different AppSec tooling. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, I guess. Amazing. So I think those were all the questions. Uh, so thank you everyone for joining uh, this session. Hope you learned something useful that you can incorporate in your project or in your organization. Thank you so much.